Look, the Americans didn't want to destroy the euro. The Americans were skeptical about the euro. They were saying to Europeans, what are you doing? You want to federate? Federate. But don't federate your money. Because the Americans are, whatever you may say about them, at least they are smart. Mm -hmm. And they are more practically minded. Mm -hmm. And they think globally. Uh, Germans do not think globally. Mm -hmm. they, they were at the time, you see, the, the German mindset you have to understand, I appreciate it, I appreciate it. They just didn't want to be a global power again. They wanted one thing. And I think Chinese people understand. Mm. They wanted to be the workshop of Europe. They wanted to, to make good washing machines and, and, you know, great propellers for your ships here in the shipyards. Mm. They wanted to make electronics. They wanted to make pharmaceuticals. They, wa they wanted to build things mm -hmm. and make money out of that without dominating Europe or the world. As global economic tensions rise and the balance of power shifts, how have Germany and the U.S. approached their roles in the world economy? Yanis Varoufakis delves into the complex relationship between these two giants, contrasting their economic strategies and outlooks. In this thought-provoking analysis, Varoufakis explains why the U.S. was skeptical of the euro and how Germany's focus on manufacturing rather than macroeconomics has left it vulnerable. He reveals how the U.S. has maintained global dominance through its monopoly on international payments, using the dollar as a tool to sustain power, even while running deficits. Through sharp insights, Varoufakis explores the lessons Germany failed to learn and how America's strategic thinking continues to shape the global order. That, that, you know, that's not a bad thing. Mm. The problem is that this means you don't have an understanding of the macroeconomic conditions under which you can do it. Who, you know, you have to, under capitalism, you need to worry about where the demand will come. Because the problem that capitalism has, as Marxism has taught us, is that it, is, it produces underconsumption. Now, from 1945, or at least 1949, 1950, all the way to the mid-1970s and beyond, the United States created the conditions for American cars, American, German cars and German pharmaceuticals and German chemicals to have markets. The Germans didn't have to think about. The Americans were managing global aggregate demand. At some point, especially after 2008, that was no longer the case. Mm -hmm. And the Germans continued not to care about managing the mm -hmm. macroeconomy. They thought that somehow, if they produce good things, mm -hmm. good manufactured goods, they will sell magically on the basis of how desirable they are. That, 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 that's simply not understanding how capitalism works. Uh, so the Americans were looking at the Euro thinking, this is going to be a problem for you folks. Think about it carefully. One reason for essentially turning against Europe by Washington DC yeah. was that the Americans wanted to teach the Europeans and particularly the Germans a lesson. You cannot continue to export unemployment to the United States, but just because you're not doing the right thing by your own people. Mm -hmm. uh, and now they have won, because now the German government is completely in a state of panic. Yeah. Every time a major power goes into the red, it starts fading and the fall is very close. In the case of the United States, between 1971 and 2020, let's say, its hegemony and power increased exponentially along with its trade deficit. It is the only power in the world that became stronger as a result of going deeper into a deficit. That has never happened before. How did they succeed in doing it? And this is your answer. By maintaining a strict monopoly on international payments. It was the only country in the history of the planet that had a currency which was in demand. People wanted the dollar, even if they didn't want to buy anything from the Americans. Because when you put petrol in your car, if you still have a petrol car, okay? Even if it is a company owned by the Dutch and it buys um, oil drilled in, let's say, Nigeria, from a Nigerian company, and there's no American involved at all. 
every time, because it's denominated in dollars, every time you fill up your petrol tank, you are demanding dollars. You have to convert pounds or yen or euros into dollars. So the, so the ownership of the international payment system is what allows the United States, much more so than the ubiquitous US Army, Navy, and Air Force, to maintain his hegemony. Kissinger knew that. I mentioned that in the book. In 1970, he asked his people around him. Kissinger back then was National Security Council. He was a National Security Advisor to Nixon before he became Foreign Secretary. And he said to them, how are we going to maintain our hegemony if we are in the red? And the answer he got was, we'll make other people, other capitalists, capitalists from the rest of the world, pay for our deficits. This is what has been happening. But why is it that they can do that? Because they have the monopoly of the payment system internationally. What WeChat does, it is threatens that monopoly. Remember the story with the German manufacturer? He's out of the dollar system. If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and share your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to subscribe and click the notification bell so you never miss out on our latest content.